Hi, this is Dr. Joshua Cooper, and I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. Thank you so much for joining me for this talk on activation mapping. The initial inspiration for this talk was a few difficult cases that I and my colleagues had experienced where activation mapping did not seem to give us the answers we were looking for when trying to map and ablate arrhythmias in the heart. And the question came up, why was that so? I have found over the years that to understand a technology or a technique to the fullest, if you understand how it could go wrong, how it may not work properly, that actually gives you the most insight into whatever tool we're discussing so that you can understand when it does work, how it benefits you, but also understand the limitations. So I started creating this presentation with the discussion of windowing, picking a window of interest, which is the more complex end of activation mapping. But as I started putting slides together, I realized that I needed to give more background, especially if there was anyone viewing or listening who had less experience with activation mapping. And so the final product that you're going to see today is actually a full presentation starting with the very basics of activation mapping and working toward several common scenarios where activation mapping may mislead you because there is some issue that was not appreciated. And I get on at the end into the complex topic of picking a window of interest, which again was the initial inspiration for the talk. I decided to record and post this online because of a robust discussion that we had on Twitter. You can see my Twitter handle there, at NarrowQRS. And for those of you who are so inclined, please follow me and my colleagues. There is a robust community of electrophysiologists and cardiologists on Twitter, and we have discussions on a daily basis about the whole range of topics in electrophysiology. So let's get started. I wanted to just first start by showing an example case that was typical of those that inspired this talk, where I started to think about the window of interest and how activation mapping can mislead you during an attempt to find the origin of a tachycardia. For those of you who are new with activation mapping, please bear with me uh, through these first few slides. I realize they're more sophisticated, but I'm then going to backtrack and start with the very basics. So uh, again, thank you for your patience as I review for some of the more sophisticated viewers uh, a complex case. This particular one was an atrial tachycardia with a cycle length of 270 milliseconds. And of course, we decided to create an activation map. And as is typical, we had a coronary sinus catheter in place and we used the 7-8 pair of electrodes as our timing reference. We created a window of interest that spanned the reference uh, electrode and covered the full cycle length of the tachycardia. And here is the map that was created. And at first glance, this activation map shows a red early spot here on the floor right adjacent to a purple late spot on the floor of the right atrium. This is the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava, and this is the tricuspid valve cut out. And when you see red meets purple, you initially think, well, this is a circuit revolving around the right atrium, which is what typical atrial flutter is. But when we used entrainment mapping, a complementary mapping technique to confirm that in fact this was atrial flutter, it absolutely was not atrial flutter because entrainment at the low part of the atrium on both sides of this line showed that that it was not in the tachycardia circuit or close to the origin. So we were confused. So we said, well, maybe our window of interest was misplaced. So instead, we moved the window of interest a little earlier and used the very same points to create a new activation map, which now looked like this which was even more confusing. You can see here that there are multiple early areas. There's maybe some orange to red up in the superior vena cava. 
and some red over here on the lateral right atrium and adjacent to late. Uh, but again, when we did entrainment in these areas, we showed that this was not anywhere near the origin or the circuit of this tachycardia. So we said, well, maybe we need to create a later window. Maybe we moved it in the wrong direction. So we created a window of minus 80 to plus 190 milliseconds around our coronary sinus reference electrogram and came up with this map. Now we have red areas on the septum. Again, we're looking at this from the really the patient's left side. And you can see sort of a broad area of red to orange uh, here on the septum, but not really in any pinpoint location. Now we don't have an early meets late component. Uh, and when we did entrainment uh, near the valve here, for example, it again showed that we were not right at the circuit or tachycardia. Uh, so at this point, we decided to abandon activation mapping because it was giving us information that didn't seem to be helpful. And we went to entrainment mapping, which is a topic for another time. And when we created an entrainment map looking for which spots were in or immediately adjacent to the tachycardia circuit or origin, we found this. There was a clear region of post pacing interval being uh, identical to the tachycardia cycle length. And in fact, uh, when we placed ablation lesions at this location, the tachycardia terminated. And so we went back to the various activation maps that we had created to figure out what could have gone wrong. Why did the activation maps not lead us to this location the way entrainment mapping did? So here I have put the three activation maps that I showed before and the entrainment map side by side so you can easily compare them. And notice how the ablation lesions on the first three maps are really not near the red earliest spot, regardless of which window was selected. But the entrainment map showed us exactly where we needed to ablate in order to effectively terminate the tachycardia. So the question, of course, remains, why did these activation maps not lead us to the conclusion we needed to guide the ablation strategy? And thus was born this talk. Over time, talking to my colleagues and talking to my Twitter friends, I quickly discovered that I was not the only one who had had cases like this. Here is just one example of somebody who was sharing a map where they were figuring out what would be the most appropriate window of interest because the effective lesions were not at all in the location where the earliest spot was identified on activation mapping. And so there was clearly an unmet need that I wanted to address by creating this slide set and presentation. So let's go back and start at the beginning to review the purpose of activation mapping. Now for those more sophisticated viewers, you're more than welcome to skip ahead a few slides where I start to review some scenarios where activation mapping may go wrong. Uh, but for those to whom this topic is new, let's keep going. The purpose of creating a three-dimensional activation map is to get extremely accurate timing information at different locations in a chamber of the heart during an arrhythmia that you're trying to identify, usually for the purpose of catheter ablation and elimination. The computer system will remember all of the data you acquire in three-dimensional space, and it's intended to display this information in a very easy to view format so that you can take a quick glance at this map and process all of this complex data very quickly to draw a conclusion.
and thereby you should be able to find the spot of origin of a focal tachycardia for the purpose of ablation, or to define the circuit if you have a macro reentry tachycardia in the atrium or the ventricle. Sometimes you can actually use the activation map to differentiate between the two, although that's a little bit more complicated and in part depends on the size of the reentry circuit. If it's a large circuit that revolves around an entire chamber, it's actually relatively easy to identify this with activation mapping, but if it's a medium or small sized circuit, it can be difficult to differentiate that from a focal tachycardia. You don't need a 3D map in order to look at local activation times and create an activation map in your head. You could use a different imaging modality such as fluoroscopy. But the problem is you're gonna to have to remember in three-dimensional space, every time you move your mapping catheter around in multiple views, you'll have to remember exactly what the timing was at each location, and that's difficult to do. And so that's the benefit of having a dedicated three-dimensional system that will keep track of this information for you and display it in a way that's easy to access. So here's the basic concept of activation mapping. You pick a stable, accurate, consistent reference point during an arrhythmia that's occurring in the electrophysiology lab. And that point can be on the surface EKG, part of the QRS, or it could be an intracardiac electrogram. <clears throat> and I will review in the upcoming slides when one or the other is most appropriate. <clears throat> because of the AV node and the variation in timing that can occur between beats getting from the atrium to the ventricle or the ventricle to the atrium, you should really use a reference point that is in the same chamber as the arrhythmia you're mapping. So using an atrial reference for atrial arrhythmias and a ventricular reference for ventricular arrhythmias. Once you have an acceptable stable reference point, which by the way will almost never be at the very beginning of each beat, it's usually going to be somewhere in the middle of the beat, you can then move your ablation or mapping catheter around to different points within the chamber you're mapping. And at each point, compare the timing where you are to the timing of your reference. And you may be earlier than the reference, you may be on time with the reference, or you may be later than the reference point. Here's a visual representation of what you're doing with activation mapping. This egg-shaped object represents a cardiac chamber, and you have an arrhythmia going along, it's some tachycardia, and you could use, for example, the surface QRS and say, I'm going to pick the peak of the QRS in a particular lead as your reference point as time zero. Anything that you map that falls earlier than your reference point is defined as having a negative number. And anything that falls later than your reference point when you're mapping around is defined as a positive number. That's just the convention that's been adopted. You can also have a catheter in the heart and use the electrogram as your reference point, your time zero. And that's often done with atrial arrhythmias, as I'll review shortly. So let's say you put your ablation catheter at this location, your mapping catheter, I should say, and you record a signal that's 50 milliseconds in front of either your catheter reference or the peak of this QRS complex, whatever you're using as a reference. And then you move your ablation catheter to other places throughout that chamber. And at every location, you're going to have a number, either a negative or a positive number, depending on whether that spot activation wise is earlier or later than your reference. Now, this is in fact an activation map, right? Like this, but it's hard to scan 
the screen and look at every single number, which is why three-dimensional mapping systems have adopted color conventions, which makes it much easier to very quickly assess the information. So here, for example, is the very earliest spot we have found of those we sampled at minus 90 milliseconds in this hypothetical example. And mapping systems are all a little different from each other in terms of how they operate, but there have been some general conventions that are used regardless of the vendor in terms of how the information is displayed. Typically, the earliest spot that has been mapped is identified with the color red. The latest spot or region that has been mapped is identified with the color purple. And all of the spots in between are the other colors of the rainbow. So now you don't have to read each number on the screen, but in fact you can quickly scan to look for the red area and that tells you that that's the earliest spot. It's much easier to see when colors are used than having to look at individual numbers. The mapping system will usually blend and smooth these colors one into another. And you'll end up with this schema to basically direct your eye and your catheter to the location that is earliest, again with the goal of identifying the origin of a tachycardia, usually for the purpose of catheter ablation and cure. Let's talk about how to set up that reference point. It's not necessarily a red dot, but some mapping systems use a red dot, so that's what I'm going to use in these examples. So the little red dot that I'm going to briefly discuss represents your time zero, whether you choose a surface QRS and the peak of lead three, for example, or the depth of AVR, or you can use one of the precordial leads like the peak of V4. It doesn't matter as long as each beat during the tachycardia looks similar to the others and the computer is very easily able to put this red dot in exactly the same location with each beat. The reason why that's so critical is that this red dot serves as your zero marker for essentially a timing ruler. If the red dot shifts around even a little bit, then when you're looking at the timing and measuring the location and timing of a locally mapped signal, you're gonna get a different number if your reference moves around a little bit. And therefore, all of your points will be comparing apples and oranges, which you don't want to do when you're creating a map in one chamber during a single tachycardia. So having a sharp reference point that the computer can repeatedly and reliably identify as a reference is absolutely critical as the first step for creating an activation map. So here, for example, is a really nice sharp part of a QRS and beat after beat, the computer is able to identify that same spot so your ruler doesn't move. Conversely, if you were to use this broad, not so sharp part of this QRS, then the computer might pick different spots, uh, even dramatically so, and that will totally shift the timing from each point that you're sampling and will mess up your map. And as I'll show, even a single point that's out of place timing-wise can affect the quality of your data and mislead you with regard to the activation map. It's very appropriate for you to turn and ask whoever your mapping specialist is at the beginning of the case, could you please show me what are you using as a timing reference for this case, for this arrhythmia? And they'll gladly show you and you can decide if you agree that that's a good reference to use, one that's consistent. When you're making an activation map in the atrium, 
there are some issues that come up that are not as problematic in the ventricles. First of all, there are some electrical barriers in the atria that are not really a problem in the ventricles. You have more anatomic barriers, not just the mitral and tricuspid valves, but you have the superior and inferior vena cava, you have the pulmonary veins, you have uh, specific pathways that signals tend to communicate between the right and left atrium, which are a little more limited than the way the right and left ventricles communicate. It's more common to have full thickness fibrosis in the thin-walled atria from aging, from other cardiac conditions or other systemic conditions that can lead to signals traveling around those areas of scar rather than smoothly traveling across the atrial chamber. You can have scar created by a surgeon or by an electrophysiologist with incisions made in the heart during cardiac surgery or previous catheter ablations performed, again, creating difficulty of signals traveling smoothly across the atria. You also can have more variability in conduction. You can have areas of slow conduction in areas of scar. You can actually have more directionality called anisotropy. That means that signals travel preferentially in one direction rather than perpendicular to that direction. And as I mentioned above, the right to left atrial communications can vary one person to another and can also provide barriers to smooth transition of signals across the atrial chambers. It is very important when creating an activation map in the atria to use an intracardiac atrial electrogram, not the EKG. As I mentioned in a previous slide, for atrial mapping, you don't want to use a ventricular reference because of the variation in atrial ventricular timing that you can see. And if you said, well, I'll just use a P wave, the problem is P waves can be very small, rounded rather than sharp, and often they're hidden behind QRS complexes and T waves, making it very difficult for the computer to reliably put that little red dot in the same place with each beat. However, intracardiac electrograms are sharp and stable and visible. Here is just an example of a patient with atrial flutter, and we're looking at the surface EKG showing flutter waves. If you picked this depth of this flutter wave as your reference, you might find that on other beats, the computer either uh, misplaces the red dot to a slightly different location on the flutter or P wave, or it may not be able to see it at all because it's completely swamped out by the QRS or by the T wave. However, if you have intracardiac electrograms that are sharp, the computer is very easily able to reproducibly place the red dot, your reference spot on that electrogram in exactly the same location with each beat, giving you a stable ruler. Let's move on to the little yellow dot. The yellow dot shows you when you're moving your mapping catheter around from point to point where the computer thinks the timing should be for that spot. It usually will pick by default the sharpest deflection. Here's one example. Here's another example. And yet another. Electrograms in the heart can be very complicated. It may have multiple, they may have multiple components. And the computer will automatically pick what it thinks is appropriate for each beat. And you as the operator may disagree. You may decide, for example, on this beat that you find this little signal to be of value and you think that should be the local timing that you're interested in. You may find that this is not of value and in fact you wanted to pick this location. It gets even more complicated when you have fractionated electrograms which have multiple components and occupy a certain period of time. You can on each point and should adjust the timing of the little yellow dot to reflect 
what you think is the most appropriate local activation time for that beat at that location, which may differ from what the computer assigned to that electrogram in that spot. As I mentioned, this yellow dot, whether the computer assigns it or whether you adjust it, is known as the local activation time. That is the timing point at the location where your mapping catheter is currently located. So how do we compare the red dot and the yellow dot? Well, in this example, the red dot shows on that beat what our reference is. The yellow dot is going to be compared to that time zero. In this case, the electrogram in the ablation catheter is later than your reference time, and that's going to give you a positive number. If you move the catheter around and find a location where your signal is earlier, then you're going to have a negative number for your local activation time. So the comparison of timing between the red reference dot and the yellow local activation time reference dot is going to tell you information about each spot in the chamber when you're mapping during tachycardia. Again, it's very acceptable during the procedure for you to turn to your mapping expert and say, could you please show me how you're deciding to pick the local activation time? This is a matter of some debate. Some people use the beginning of the electrogram. Some people use the peak of the electrogram. Some people use the sharpest deflection in the electrogram, and I'm not going to get into that today. But you need to be consistent during your map if you want to compare apples and apples from one point to another. For the next series of slides, I'm actually going to show some examples of creating activation maps for different arrhythmias. And in order to do that, I created a very simple schematic for the right and the left atrium. And I'll show you the labels on how I intended to draw these two chambers so that we're all on the same page. And I created essentially a pixelated grid. And in order for signals to travel across this grid, I decided just for ease of creating these examples to have signals travel only left, right, or up, down. So for example, for a wavefront to travel from the top of the right atrium to the bottom lateral part of the left atrium, this would be the path that that signal would take. Now, of course, you're always going to have wavefronts traveling in multiple directions. So if you had a tachycardia coming from this location, in this simplified schematic, the way wavefronts would travel would look like this. And again, it's very simplified, but you'll see it will make the point in terms of activation mapping and will make it more complicated as the scenarios get more complicated. So let's start with an atrial tachycardia where the top chambers are firing at a cycle length of 300 milliseconds. And we're going to create an activation map of this tachycardia. So we put in a coronary sinus catheter and we decide to use the 5-6 pair of electrodes as our reference point, our red dot, our time zero. And we put our mapping or ablation catheter up into the right atrium from the inferior vena cava, and we sample the electrogram during the tachycardia at this spot and create a little yellow dot. And when we compare, the timing is minus 50 milliseconds. So we say, terrific, let's move the catheter to another location. And at this location, we get minus 20. It's a little later than the first spot we sampled. And we move to another location, minus 80, and so on and so forth. And we create, little by little, pixel by pixel, an activation map of the right atrium. And just for the sake of thoroughness, we went over to the left atrium and we created an activation map over there as well. So we've sampled all parts of both the right and the left atrium, 
and looked at the local activation times from each of these locations. Well, how does this translate into an activation map? We first find the earliest and the latest spots. The earliest is now circled in red, that's minus 90 milliseconds. And the latest is over here, uh, circled in purple, plus 30 milliseconds. And we now look toward our rainbow of colors. There are seven main colors that are used. And we basically divide up the total activation time between the minus 90 milliseconds and the plus 30 milliseconds uh, for a total of 120 milliseconds. And we say, okay, well, if the total time it takes to activate the atria is 120 milliseconds, and there are seven colors, that means about 17 milliseconds uh, zones will encompass each of the colors, something like this. So now we can assign the appropriate color to each pixel based on the local activation time. And it'll look something like this. Notice that what's colored red is between minus 73 and minus 90 milliseconds. So that includes the minus 80 and the minus 90 millisecond pixels and so on and so forth. And we can quickly visually see that the earliest spot in both atria is near the top of the right atrium and therefore that may be the point of origin of this tachycardia. Now you may say, I want to narrow the focus of this red area that's too broad, not specific enough. There are many ways you can manually manipulate the activation map to help you. And that includes compressing the color scale. So instead of evenly distributing the time between the seven colors, you can say, I'm going to restrict the time with red and expand the time with purple. And you can shift the color spectrum in this way. So now, for example, there's only a five millisecond spread with the red color and a 30 millisecond spread with the purple color. And it will make the map change to look more like this. So now, instead of a broader red area, you have a more pinpoint focal area that can lead your eye and your ablation catheter more precisely to the earliest spot. And hopefully that is the area you're looking for to target with catheter ablation. And so here we have correctly identified the source of this focal atrial tachycardia and can eliminate it. What if we decided instead of using a catheter in the coronary sinus as our reference to put a catheter along the crista up to the superior vena cava and use that the pair of electrodes at the distal end one two as our reference and we have the same tachycardia how will that impact our map will it completely change it and mess it up well let's see i've now created a new activation map using a completely different reference. And the numbers are all different in each pixel because the relative timing at each location compared to our reference is of course going to be different because our reference is in a completely different location. However, if you look and see what is the earliest spot and the latest spot, those remain the same even though the relative time is different the absolute earliest and latest are no different. And if you now create the same color spectrum using the compressed spectrum that I just showed, you're going to have minus 40 milliseconds be your earliest plus 80 milliseconds be your latest, but there's still 120 milliseconds between them. And here is how the colors will be splayed out, again, with the compressed color spectrum. And if you apply those colors to this new activation map, it will look exactly the same as the map looked with the reference in a different location, because the origin is the same. 
And this is reassuring to know that it's not really that critical which location you use as your reference as long as it's consistent throughout the map you're creating. Here I've shown side-by-side -side maps with the CS coronary sinus reference on the left and the Crista terminalis or SVC reference on the right, highlighting the fact that even though the local activation times are all different, the color coding and activation map is identical. That's point number one. Let's move on to another tachycardia and map it. Again, I have a coronary sinus catheter in place. We'll use the same reference. And I've mapped the right atrium. And let's color code it after looking for the earliest and latest spots. Here we go. And now I've expanded the color spectrum again to make it even throughout. And here is our color map. Okay, terrific. So now we've found that the origin of this tachycardia is near the septum in the right atrium. The problem is, if you were to say, wonderful, I'm going to ablate at this location because this looks like the point of origin of this tachycardia, you'll be disappointed. You're going to find that it will not work. Why is that? Well, let's actually go and map the left atrium after being unsuccessful with ablation in the right atrium. If you travel to the left atrium and make additional activation mapping over there, you're going to find a surprise, which is that there's in fact yet an earlier spot than the earliest one you found in the right atrium. Here it is. It's minus 60 milliseconds compared to the reference, whereas the earliest spot you found in the right atrium was only minus 40. So if you now create a new activation map of both atria together, you're going to find a different color pattern. You're going to find now the origin appears to have shifted from what we thought was in the right atrium near the septum over to the left atrium near the mitral valve. This demonstrates a very uh, common problem with activation mapping if you are not thorough. Recognize that the red and purple colors and those in between only reflect the points that you've sampled. If you're incomplete in mapping a particular chamber or you failed to map the opposite chamber and then in fact is the point of origin, then you're going to get a map that's misleading because again, it's only going to show you the earliest spot of the locations you sampled, not the absolute earliest spot. It can't possibly know what's the earliest spot unless you put your catheter there. Here I have put side by side the incomplete map of just the right atrium on the left and the full biatrial map on the right. And so the point of wisdom here is, especially if you're mapping the right atrium first and find that the earliest spot appears to be on the septum, you must consider the possibility that there are earlier spots on the other side of the interatrial septum in the left atrium that you haven't yet sampled. Sometimes there are tachycardias coming from the septum and whether or not you map the other side, you might well successfully ablate them on the septum, but you need to consider the possibility, especially before ablating, that you may not have a complete map. And recognize that you will still get a red area if you have an incomplete map. And that does not tell you that you are at the site of origin. It just tells you the earliest spot of the locations you sampled. Let's move on to a macro reentry circuit like atrial flutter rather than a focal tachycardia like we were just reviewing. Here is atrial flutter with a cycle length of 270 milliseconds, and we created an activation map of the right atrium using the coronary sinus 5-6 pair as our reference. 
and here is the color spectrum that is shown when we develop this activation map. Notice that the biggest difference with this map is that now you have a red area adjacent to a purple area, which we did not see with the focal tachycardias. This is known as an early meets late location. When you see this, it suggests the possibility that you have a large circuit that's coming all the way around back to the beginning, and it encompasses the full cycle length of the tachycardia. The question then comes up, what happens if you move your reference point with a macro reentrant tachycardia? Will it be identical to the case of the focal tachycardia where the color map will look the same? Or is that not the case? Well, here we've moved our reference catheter back to the Krista terminalis location, and we're using the 3-4 pair of electrodes as our reference. And I created a new activation map of this same atrial flutter. And now we get this color pattern where the red area has shifted and the purple area has likewise shifted and the early meets late location is totally different. I'm going to review in the windowing section of this talk why this happens that with a macro reentrant circuit, when you move the reference location, you're going to shift the color map. But it's important to recognize before we even get into the topic of windowing, that early meets late simply shows you that there is likely a macro reentry circuit present, but does not guide you with regard to the location for the optimal ablation strategy. You could make the early meets late be almost anywhere around the circumference of the right atrium, depending on what you use as a reference and how you pick your window. And that's arbitrary. It's not absolute. So don't be fooled into thinking that you must ablate along the border between early and late. That's almost never the case unless you happen to get lucky and you have that early meets late location happen to be at the anatomic location, which makes the most sense for ablation of atrial flutter, which is on the cavotricuspid isthmus, the floor that joins the tricuspid valve and the inferior vena cava, which happens to be the shortest and most efficient distance to ablate in order to terminate atrial flutter and prevent it from recurring. Here, side by side, is the same atrial flutter circuit showing how the color map changes when you change your reference point on the left, the coronary sinus reference, and on the right, the Krista terminalis reference point, and how the activation map shifts. Let's move on to yet another tachycardia and demonstrate another principle. Here's our coronary sinus catheter and reference. Here is an activation map created of this third tachycardia. And we find the earliest and the latest spots. And we color code the atria accordingly. Here now, the earliest spot of activation is on the floor of the right atrium. And there is no early meets late, giving us perhaps a hint that this may be focal rather than macro reentrant. However, this patient happened to have had previous atrial flutter and had an atrial flutter ablation, creating a permanent electrical line of block between the tricuspid valve and the inferior vena cava. If we create an activation map of this exact same focal tachycardia from the medial floor of the right atrium, you're going to see something very different now that we have an electrical barrier that was created in a previous ablation. The earliest and latest spots are different. Well, the earliest spot is the same, but the latest spot 
is very different. So it's on the opposite side of that electrical barrier. And now you have a longer total activation time of the chamber, and you have what appears to be an early meets late location uh, on the floor of the right atrium. Notice red and purple are now adjacent to each other, even though this is the identical tachycardia to what we had on the previous slide without the flutter ablation line. So this demonstrates an important principle, especially when we compare the two maps with and without cavotricuspid isthmus ablation. These both represent a eustachian ridge atrial tachycardia coming from the floor of the right atrium on the medial side of the isthmus. But what turns out to be the latest spot will shift depending on other electrical barriers. And you could easily be misled on the right to thinking that this is atrial flutter because it looks very similar to the atrial flutter case that I showed previously. So the question then comes, how would you distinguish a focal atrial tachycardia with a previous flutter line from actual flutter? And the answer is you sometimes need to use a complementary mapping technique, in this case, entrainment mapping. If this were atrial flutter, then if you performed an entrainment maneuver anywhere around the tricuspid valve, you would find the post-pacing interval to be the same as the tachycardia cycle length, confirming that all of this was in the circuit. However, in this case of a focal tachycardia coming from the eustachian ridge with a line of block here, if you were to do a entrainment maneuver from the lateral isthmus, it will be way out because you couldn't electrically be further from the origin because signals have to travel all the way around the tricuspid valve in order to get from one side to the other. So this will be way out and will tell you for sure that this is not atrial flutter. And that highlights the need for gathering different types of information in any electrophysiology and ablation case in order to be sure that the data that you're using are accurate and are guiding your ablation strategy appropriately. Here is that very first tachycardia that I showed, again with the shifted color spectrum. And this was a focal tachycardia coming from the top of the right atrium. And I want to show what can happen if you have even a single data point that's wrong, because either the computer put the yellow dot in the wrong place, or uh, your mapping expert put the yellow dot in a place that you hadn't intended, uh, and what can happen to the color map with even just one spot out of place. Notice the earliest spot in this biatrial map is minus 90 milliseconds, and the latest is plus 30, and we have color-coded it as I showed you earlier. What if, however, at this location where I show this square, instead of this spot being minus 30 milliseconds, a yellow dot is put on a little electrical artifact erroneously that's not an electrogram that was of interest. And let's say that little artifact, instead of showing up here, the yellow dot shows up here. Let's say that artifact creates a local activation time of minus 130 milliseconds. Well, now that's going to become your red spot because it's now the earliest spot on the map, even one single point. And now when you color code the map, the true origin of the tachycardia will appear as a color signifying later activation. And your mapping system is going to interpolate the other colors and suggest that this area of red is somewhere of interest being the earliest spot. This is why when you're creating the map, whether you're using one mapping catheter uh, at a time, one pair of electrodes at a time, or a mapping catheter with multiple pairs of electrodes, every single activation time that's added to your map needs to be scrutinized to make sure that the yellow dot, that the local activation time is precisely where you want it. Because even one point out of place 
will completely change the map. Now often, as you're creating the map, you'll start to form an impression about where the tachycardia is coming from. And if your impression suddenly shifts after you take a point or two and you say, wow, there was a sudden immediate change, and you notice that the arrhythmia itself didn't change, that would be a red flag to have you go back and immediately scrutinize the most recently added points to make sure that in fact the color scheme appropriately changed or that it didn't change appropriately and in fact you have a corrupt data point or two that shifted the map in a way that you hadn't intended. You can then either erase those points or change the local activation time to reflect uh, the truth. I'm actually now going to move on to the more complex topic of windowing. And you'll have to forgive me uh, for this little interlude. I wanted a couple slides to highlight the middle of the talk so that people who are going to jump ahead could uh, find these slides uh, and, uh, and join in on this latter part of the lecture. When I was thinking about the concept of window of interest, for some reason that phraseology uh, made me think of Harry Potter, such as Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And I thought, well, maybe we need a new installment, Harry Potter and the Window of Interest. It was late at night when I created these slides, so thank you for your indulgence. Here is the way I'm going to display the data moving forward uh, for this topic of window of interest. This window is now going to reflect the view in the 3D mapping system. It's usually a gated view so that the surface EKG and the intracardiac reference electrograms appear to be stationary as the screen flickers because with each beat, the computer overlays that beat on top of where the previous beat was. So what I mean by that is you'll see the screen appear to move, but the electrograms stay stationary. Here you see the surface EKG displayed. You see your coronary sinus uh, reference electrograms displayed with the red dot that was used to select coronary sinus 5, 6, the peak of this electrogram as our stationary and consistent reference. The mapping catheter, whether it's an ablation catheter or otherwise, will also be displayed, but that electrogram as you move the catheter around will move. So here, for example, is an electrogram from one location and the local activation time was automatically placed by the computer and can of course be moved by the mapping expert. As you move your catheter to a different location, there will be a different electrogram in a different timing spot compared to your reference. A third location, again, a different timing. As you move your catheter over and over to flesh out the chamber during this activation map, you're going to see electrograms at all kinds of locations and your local activation time change from one place to the next. As I discuss the concept of window of interest, I'm going to want to look at all of these electrograms at the same time. It's going to be critical to appreciate the full spectrum of electrograms that are acquired during the creation of an activation map. If I showed them all superimposed, it would look like this. And that's somewhat confusing because of the overlap. And so what I've decided to do in terms of how to display the information in a way that makes sense is I've exploded out these electrograms vertically so that you can at least see the distinct electrograms and the time frame that they occupy. Let's talk about a focal tachycardia. Here is your window on your mapping system. 
you've selected a reference point of an intracardiac electrogram for this focal atrial tachycardia. You create a window of interest. Now, what does that mean? That means that, as you'll notice, there actually are two beats here on the screen. And when you create an activation map, you really only want to sample electrograms from the one beat of interest. So you have to tell the computer what are the boundaries of that beat. And commonly, people will say, well, let me just split the difference of the tachycardia cycle length. And if the tachycardia cycle length is 300 milliseconds, for example, then they will start at time zero at the red dot reference point, and they will go earlier than that point by 150 milliseconds, half of the cycle length, and 150 milliseconds later than that spot, with the total, of course, being the 300 milliseconds of the tachycardia itself. And you've now created what we call a window of interest. This is the area that the computer will focus on when it's looking for local activation times and local electrograms. If an electrogram appears in the shaded areas outside the window of interest, then the computer will ignore it because it will say, well, that electrogram falls in a previous beat or a subsequent beat, and I'm not interested in that one. I only want to look at electrograms that are on this beat at this moment in time. So here, for example, is an electrogram again from the mapping catheter with its local activation time. And here is another one, and here is another one. And as we flesh out this activation map, we create electrograms at different locations and the computer is seeing them all within the window of interest and creating your color activation map as you go. The earliest electrogram now shown in aqua is going to show up as red in your color three-dimensional map which I'm obviously not showing at the moment. Notice that there will be an identical compendium of electrograms on the previous beat that if we didn't have the window of interest created as we did, the computer might look at one of these and put a little yellow dot on there and show that it's really early compared to our reference. But we want to ignore these because they belong to a previous beat and not the beat of interest. In this focal tachycardia, notice how there is a big gap between the last electrogram in one beat and the first electrogram in the next. That's because the time it takes to activate the atria is relatively quick, and the tachycardia is significantly slower than that time so that the P wave completes, the atria fully depolarize, and there is a period of electrical diastole between atrial beats. That's really helpful and important when creating a window of interest and an activation map because it allows you a lot of leeway with regard to where you've put your two limits on your window of interest. I could shift the window earlier or later. I could shrink it or expand it. And all of the electrograms that are relevant here on this beat for this tachycardia that were compiled on a sequence of beats, they're all still going to fall within the window of interest regardless of how I had shifted those limits. And the reason is because of that yellow bracketed gap of nothingness between one beat and the next allows you to put those barriers almost anywhere 
other than too close together or shifting it way far in one direction or the other where you start to cut off some of the electrograms of interest into the gray area. So the way I would describe this very simple, almost foolproof window of interest is comparing the tachycardia cycle length, which I'm going to call X, and considering the time it takes to depolarize the whole chamber, which I'm going to call Y. And here, X is relatively long, and Y is relatively short or quick. And again, in this scenario, if X is much greater than Y, it's really easy to create a window of interest and capture the electrograms you want and ignore the electrograms you don't. Let's shift for a moment to a macro reentrant tachycardia like atrial flutter. And this picks up on a point that we made earlier when we talked about shifting your reference point and shifting the color scheme of atrial flutter. Here are flutter waves on the surface EKG. Here we've selected coronary sinus 1, 2 arbitrarily as our uh, reference point. And the difference between atrial flutter and a focal tachycardia is that while in a focal tachycardia the P wave happens and then there's electrical diastole with nothing going on, during atrial flutter there's always something going on. By definition, it's a circuit that keeps happening over and over again. The wave front is revolving around the right atrium continuously, so there isn't any point in time where there isn't something happening electrically. And that's reflected on the surface in the continuous and undulating nature of the atrial activity where there's no flat isoelectric part and it's reflected intracardiac wise by seeing electrograms everywhere without any gap between one beat and the next. So if we were to create a window of interest here, let's say again we split the difference and we create a window of interest that is symmetrical around our reference point and encompasses the full tachycardia, that will define what is the earliest point that falls within our window of interest, shown in aqua here. If I had decided to move my window of interest earlier, not have it be symmetrical around my reference point, then I'm going to change what is the earliest spot. It'll be a different location, and therefore a different spot in the atrium will appear red in our three-dimensional color map. And likewise, if I shift it later, yet a different location will appear as red and earliest. And similarly, if I were to change my reference location, in this case, shifting it from coronary sinus 1-2 pair of electrodes to the coronary sinus 9-10 pair of electrodes, it's sort of similar to shifting it to the crista or wherever. Here, we can see the earliest point of activation using CS12 as our reference and creating a symmetrical window of interest. But if I shift to coronary sinus 910 and create a new window that is symmetrical around that reference, I've now shifted my earliest spot from here to here. This is the explanation for why the color scheme changed in atrial flutter when we switched from a coronary sinus reference to a crista reference. The reason is, is that we now have continuous activation of the atrium all the time, and therefore there will always be electrograms at the very start up to the very end of your window of interest. And if you shift the window of interest around by moving the reference point to a different location or by shifting the window earlier or later around the same reference point, you're going to arbitrarily create a different location that's going to show up as red. You will still have an early meets late, a red meets purple, 
but the location for where that happens will shift. So conversely, compared to the focal tachycardia, if you have a tachycardia cycle length that is identical by definition to the chamber activation time, as is the case with macro reentrant atrial flutter. And you're again talking about a macro reentry situation. You're going to get arbitrary windowing. You can shift red wherever you want it to be, but you will still define the circuit with an early meets late location and you can confirm that the different places within the circuit are in in fact the tachycardia by using entrainment maneuvers as a complementary mapping technique. Here's where it gets really interesting. What if you have a focal tachycardia but slow conduction across the atrium in contrast to the first scenario where I said you had really speedy rapid conduction depolarizing the atria. So here are the electrograms for your beat of interest. They're not clustered anymore in a very tight time frame but in fact expanded because it takes longer to traverse the right and or left atrium. What if you look at the adjacent beat from the previous P wave and what if the electrograms at the end of that previous beat are coming up pretty close to the electrograms at the beginning of your beat of interest and likewise the next beat early electrograms are close to the last electrograms in your beat of interest it's going to become really important how you create your window of interest so you don't accidentally sample electrograms from an adjacent beat which can mess up your uh, activation map. If we were to choose CS56 in this example as our reference and we decided to split the difference with the tachycardia and create a symmetrical window of interest around that reference. Notice how we have clipped off some of the red electrograms from our uh, beat of interest and inadvertently included some early electrograms from the next beat that we actually hadn't wanted to include. The earliest spot should have been here of the beat of interest. This was red, I just overlaid it with aqua to show what we really wanted to show up as red on our map. However, this equivalent electrogram <clears throat> Uh, shows up as late, which I'll review in a moment, and instead of the true earliest spot showing up as red, an electrogram that's actually in the middle of the P wave is going to be our earliest electrogram because that's the first one that shows up within our window of interest. And our red location will be wrong if this is a focal tachycardia because we've clipped off the earliest part of the beat. And, as I was saying earlier, the earliest spot of the next beat might get inadvertently incorporated into our window of interest. And what should have shown up as red is actually going to show up as blue or purple. It's that same early electrogram, but we actually included the wrong one in our window of interest and it'll show up as late. This is a problem when you're creating an activation map, when you have a faster tachycardia and or slower activation across the right and or left atrium, because your window of interest may not include the electrograms you want. In order to get the map to work out properly, you would have had in this situation to shift the window of interest earlier so that you include properly the earliest electrogram on the beat of interest and exclude 
the earliest part of the subsequent beat. And of course, make sure you exclude the latest electrograms in the previous beat, which you don't want to cloud your map with. The problem, though, is you didn't know at the outset that you would have had to create this asymmetric window because unfortunately the electrograms don't show up in the mapping system as color-coded blue or red or yellow to tell you which beat they belong to. So in this situation, if the tachycardia cycle length, which again I call X, and the activation time of the chamber, which is now longer, are similar to each other, you can have a really difficult time creating an, a window of interest that reflects the electrograms and the beat that you intend. What if your reference point was actually really late? So for example, you have a right atrial arrhythmia and you decided to use the distal most pair of electrodes in your coronary sinus catheter uh, such that your reference point is right at the very end of the beat, you would have had to have the foresight to create an extraordinarily asymmetric window of interest in order to properly capture the electrograms that are at the start of that beat and not include electrograms from the subsequent beat. But it's very difficult to anticipate where this window should be. This is almost a conclusion derived in retrospect after you figured out what is the earliest spot and then adjust your window to, to make the map look like what you know the tachycardia is. But that's not helpful. If you knew where the site of origin was at the beginning, you wouldn't need activation mapping. You could skip it. We're using activation mapping to help us find that location. And so therefore, this presents one of the biggest problems with, uh, with activation mapping is selecting the appropriate window of interest, which is particularly problematic with faster tachycardias and with slower conduction across the atria so that the beats tend to become more adjacent to each other without much electrical diastole between them. I wanted to go back and show exactly uh, how this problem will translate into the creation of a misleading activation map. Going back again to our very first atrial tachycardia and showing the color scheme evenly distributed. Remember the tachycardia was um, coming from the top of the right atrium and we had the uh, minus 90 earliest spot here, the plus 30 latest spot here, and it looked like this. You remember that very well. I reviewed this a couple times in this talk. This tachycardia I designed um, for there to be rapid conduction in this model from pixel to pixel. So if I now show the uh, three-dimensional mapping system window, next to our color map here, you can see how all of the electrograms are clustered within the window of interest and the earliest spot falls within the window of interest and shows up as red on our map. Again, the scenario where the tachycardia cycle length and the chamber activation time are very favorable in terms of the creation of a window of interest. The previous beat over here and the subsequent beat are well out of our window of interest because of the electrical diastole that allows us a lot of leeway where we put our window. Even if we make it symmetric around our reference uh, or asymmetric, uh, it will almost certainly allow us to sample the points properly and create a color map. However, going back though to the situation where the activation time is slower because of scarring or barriers, and it's now similar to the tachycardia cycle length itself, 
your window of interest is potentially going to, as I reviewed before, clip off electrograms that are of interest and incorporate electrograms that are not. The problem is that your mapping system is not going to color code the electrograms according to what beat they belong to. It doesn't know. All it knows is which electrograms are falling in your window of interest. So here is my window of interest, somewhat symmetrical around my reference point. And instead of me showing you these red electrograms of interest, now notice what's going to happen to all these electrograms within the window of interest. They're all going to look the same. And you're going to be creating an activation color map that is going to use this information, assuming that those are all electrograms of interest. So you're going to have missed out on the earliest electrograms of this beat, and you're going to have added the early electrograms from the next beat that are going to show up as late in this window. Well, how does that translate into a color map? Here I have shown the new activation times according to the misplaced window of interest if the conduction velocity in this model slows from 10 milliseconds per pixel to 20 milliseconds per pixel. Instead of having the early spot be located here where the tachycardia is originating, now your early spot is going to be at multiple locations as indicated with the red circles and your latest spot instead of being over here is now going to be here where you've incorporated signals from the next beat that are going to be even later than the latest signals from the current beat and as you color code this activation map that's erroneous because your window of interest is inappropriate, it's going to look something like this, which is going to be confusing because now for this focal tachycardia, which is the same, instead of the origin showing up as red, you have other regions showing up as red and you have what appears to be early meets late barriers between red and purple you've essentially converted what was a focal tachycardia appearance to what almost may look like a re-entry or an early meets late type of situation simply because the window of interest was not placed appropriately. And you wouldn't have necessarily known that because again, there's no way to identify an electrogram uh, to, and assign it to a particular P wave or beat. All the 3D mapping system knows how to do is to include electrograms that are in the window of interest on the map and exclude those that are not. So going back and comparing what this will look like in that uh, mapping window, you can see that we've clipped off these electrograms that are the ones that normally would have been red, as I showed before, when they were clustered more closely and all fell within the window of interest. Because it took so long to travel across the right and the left atrium. So those electrograms that were just flashing that are clipped off, in this case, will actually be reproduced in the next beat. So this electrogram corresponds to this one, but this is the one that will get included in our map. And as I was sharing earlier, the spot that would have been red is now going to be purple or blue. There's your local activation time for what should have been the earliest spot now becomes one of the latest spots. So I've shown now in yellow numbers
the reassigned new wrong activation times because of our window of interest. And in black, what should have been the correct window of interest, sorry, the correct local activation time, excuse me. So for example, our earliest spot was minus 180 milliseconds compared to our reference. Again, it's much longer time because we have longer conduction times across the right and the left atrium. But this should have been red. It's the earliest spot on the whole map. However, because this fell outside of the window of interest, it got reassigned to a late time frame because the plus 50 time frame was what fell in the window of interest because this is actually the electrogram from the next beat. So this is how a, an activation map can be totally misleading and wrong simply because the window of interest was misplaced. It can actually get worse. What if you have a very fast tachycardia and or very slow conduction because somebody's had previous surgeries or ablation or scarring or whatever to the point where not only do the electrograms span a wider uh, time frame, but in fact, you can get overlap with the previous and the subsequent beats because when one beat is finishing, for example, conducting across the atria, the next beat has already started again. This happens. You can actually get overlap between beats where there actually are two simultaneous wave fronts happening. The new wave front from the new beat that just occurred and the old wave front from the previous beat that hasn't finished traveling across the atrial tissue. So now try to create a window of interest that only includes the desired red electrograms and ignores the blue and the yellow adjacent electrograms. It's impossible because any vertical timeline that you draw here at the beginning or at the end of your window will always encompass the adjacent beats. You're going to clip off the beats of interest at the beginning and or the end of your uh, desired beat, and you're going to incorporate the tail end of the previous beat and or the beginning of the subsequent beat. And again, remember, you're not going to have color-coded electrograms to tell you what's what. So putting it back in the same terms I was using, if your tachycardia cycle length, X, and your total activation time of the chamber, Y, have this relationship where it takes longer to get across the atria than the actual cycle length of the tachycardia with a focal or even a micro reentry mechanism, it's pretty much impossible to pick a window of interest that actually will work and give you a map that makes sense. You could say, perhaps I want to expand my window of interest so that I at least incorporate all of my desired electrograms. But if you have a window of interest that is wider, longer than your tachycardia cycle length, you're almost guaranteed to uh, incorporate erroneous electrograms from the previous and the subsequent beats into your map and that will only complicate matters. So it's really never a good idea to create a window of interest that is wider or longer than your tachycardia cycle length. Sometimes, in fact, people like to use a window of interest that is always slightly shorter, 90 to 95% of the tachycardia, just to be extra certain that you're not capturing electrograms from adjacent beats. Many people, though, will make that window identical to the tachycardia cycle length or very slightly shorter, but certainly you should not make it longer, even though that might at first glance appear to make sense. In order to demonstrate how complicated this 
can get when you have very slow conduction and or a very rapid tachycardia, I had to create a more detailed uh, atrial model with more pixels. And so here we are with our right and the left atrium with many more pixels in each. And to make it interesting and realistic, I added a couple little areas of scar that will serve as barriers. And around these areas of scar, I actually created little slower areas of conduction. And I have a little scale at the bottom for those interested where I varied the conduction speed from one pixel to an adjacent pixel anywhere between the fastest 10 milliseconds per pixel up to the slowest 25 milliseconds per pixel. And um, this is reality where in areas of scar you have slowed conduction. So here's the model that I chose to use. And I'm going to use a coronary sinus reference catheter for the arrhythmia that I'm going to create and display in this activation map that's forthcoming. Uh, again, here's 910 as the reference. And you're not intended to look at all of these local activation times, but you should appreciate the amount of time and energy that went into creating <laughs> this very detailed uh, activation map of the right and the left atrium for this tachycardia uh, that has a cycle length of 280 milliseconds. And so uh, we are going to create a color map of the right and the left atrium according to the local activation times. The window of interest is evenly split around the CS910 reference so that we have uh, minus 140 milliseconds to plus 140 milliseconds, which encompass the 280 millisecond cycle length of the tachycardia that we're going to map. And we've evenly distributed the uh, color spectrum. And the first thing I'll do is show you what shows up as red, as early. And here we are with three different locations that all show up as red uh, when starting to create an activation map of this arrhythmia, which right off the bat is confusing because you shouldn't have three points of origin of a focal tachycardia, nor should you have three different wave fronts if it's a macro reentrant tachycardia. Here is the latest uh, areas of activation, purple, uh, creating several different early meets late locations. And I'll fill in the rest of the colors. So here is your biatrial activation map for the arrhythmia that is unknown to you uh, and which we are mapping. And so the question is, how do you interpret this color map? The first question, I suppose, would be, are those red areas accurate in terms of the time? And uh, I'll zoom in on those. And you can see, indeed, the local activation times uh, for all the red areas are, uh, are in the minus 100 to minus 140 millisecond uh, time frame uh, in accordance with the scale that we've created. So they should be read based on the local activation times that fell within our window of interest. So the question is, what happened? And this is one layer more complex uh, than the previous example I showed where the top of the right atrium tachycardia showed up as purple because our window of interest clipped off the true start of the beat and incorporated the beginning of the next beat. What I'm showing here in white uh, is uh, actually, that's better, I'll zoom in, uh, is actually the 
local activation time as it fell within our window of interest. The smaller black numbers are the true local activation times, <clears throat> but they fell outside of the window of interest. So for example, this pixel mapped at a time of minus 180 milliseconds. However, our window of interest only went to minus 140 milliseconds, so that would have been excluded from our window of interest. <clears throat> and a similar electrogram fell later in the window but was included, and that fell at the plus 100 time frame, which falls within our window of interest. So all of these spots <clears throat> that have uh, white numbers that are purple and uh, blue should have been early assigned local activation times but ended up getting assigned late because they got clipped off by the left arm of our window of interest. Conversely, over here in the left atrium, in black was the true plus 150 local activation time, but because that fell outside of the right arm of our uh, window, it was not counted as such, and there was a similar electrogram from the previous beat that actually fell early in our window of interest, and so this point got assigned a really early activation time and is showing up as red, where it really should have been really late, like dark purple. And same with the other points here. So here, again, is what it would look like in the uh, window on the, uh, in the mapping window, in this example where your conduction velocity is slow enough that when you traverse both atria, it takes longer to do that than the actual cycle length of the tachycardia we're mapping. So here uh, are the minus 140 to plus 140 um, barriers or, or boundaries, I should say, around our window of interest. And you can see how some of the uh, beats Oh, and let me make this point, of course, that the tachycardia cycle length here being 280 milliseconds is shorter than the total chamber activation time, which turns out to be 335 milliseconds uh, in this model from the very earliest to the very latest point. Um, but uh, notice how the uh, earliest uh, electrograms from this beat ended up getting reassigned, and that ends up being reflected in the purple color here that actually is the wrong color assignment. And similarly, the uh, electrograms that got clipped off from the bead of interest uh, that should have appeared as late ended up getting reassigned to early, these actually belonging to the previous bead, um, but you end up finding them at the beginning of our window of interest and therefore they show up as red instead of purple. So the question is, well, how could I make this any better in hindsight um, in terms of the selection of a window of interest? We split the difference around the coronary sinus 910 pair uh, of electrodes. Um, what if instead of minus 140 to plus 140, we moved the window to minus 180 to plus 100? I shifted it early by 40 milliseconds. Well, let's see what that ends up doing to our color map. It does this. Now, at least we have two areas of red instead of three, I guess, uh, but it's still misleading in terms of looking at this representation and trying to conclude what is the mechanism and location of the arrhythmia. And uh, now, as you've shifted the window leftward, you've reduced but not eliminated the problem of clipping off the early signals, but you've worsened the problem of uh, clipping off uh, the late signals and including the late signals from the previous beat. 
So now we have more reassigned, erroneously reassigned local activation times over here and fewer uh, reassigned erroneously activation times over here. Well, what if we just shift it all the way? Again, you can't see red electrograms in real life, but in this example, we know what the true electrograms are because I created it. Um, what if we move the window another 40 milliseconds early to completely eliminate the problem of clipping the earliest signals? Because isn't that really what we want? We want to find the earliest spot. So what if we shifted the window like that? What will the map look like? Well, all of those late signals end up getting shifted early for the reasons that I mentioned, because they get clipped off and we're now in, including more signals from the previous beat. And in this minus 220 to plus 60 window, uh, now this is what the map is going to look like. We've actually gone back to three areas of red and many uh, more reassigned uh, local activation times in the left atrium and fewer in the right atrium. Uh, is this helpful? Well, it's helpful only when you know the some of the answer here, uh, where I'm telling you what electrograms belong to what beat. But in real life, you, you don't know that. And so if you were to look at this map and, and, and shift the window around and you keep seeing two or three different areas of red, regardless of where you shift the window, uh, it's going to be very confusing. What if I shift the window later? So well, what would this look like if I made sure I caught the true tail end of my uh, beat, sacrificing the very earliest part? Well, as you would predict, it doesn't really help matters at all. Uh, now, here's a minus 100 to plus 180 millisecond window, and it'll look like this. And we're back to two areas of, of red in the right atrium. Um, the left atrium looks like it makes more sense. You have a wavefront sweeping across the left atrium, I guess, with uh, purple here at the very latest uh, activation, as it's supposed to be. But um, you, you have many more falsely reassigned spots in the right atrium because you've clipped off many more early electrograms on this beat and included the early electrograms from the next beat, which will show up late in the window and therefore show up as purple. So let me show you <clears throat> the actual arrhythmia that I invented for this example. It was a small circuit around this area of scar in the top of the right atrium, as so. And then passively, the wave fronts would travel across the uh, right atrium, across the septum, and into the left atrium, and actually traverse, go around this area of slow conduction and scar. And uh, this is the actual answer to what the arrhythmia is. And the question really is, could we have identified this purely from activation mapping? And the answer is it would have been very challenging. And including entrainment mapping in your armamentarium of techniques to figure out what's going on would have been very, very helpful in this type of case. Here is the window of minus 220 to plus 60, which was probably the best window one could have selected if you wanted to identify this rhythm correctly because you have properly included the beginnings of uh, the, the electrograms at the beginning of the beat of interest. And you can see now that there is an early meets late here and a sequence of colors traveling counterclockwise around this scar. Interestingly, if you would eliminate the left atrium here and not consider it, this actually gets much easier to interpret because you don't have all of that late activation by the time the signal travels across the whole right atrium and the whole left atrium. And this is actually opposite to 
a point that I made earlier in the talk, which is you need to make sure you are comprehensive in mapping. You need to make sure that you map the whole chamber thoroughly and that you in fact even go transeptal if your earliest spot is on or near the septum and you wonder if you've in fact encompassed the origin of the tachycardia. So more mapping was better. Well here, where you have really slow conduction and a fast arrhythmia, uh, with overlapping beats, the more you map, you're going to actually confuse the situation because you're now going to have two wavefronts at any given time. Again, the wavefront from the new beat that just started and the end wavefront of the previous beat that hasn't finished traveling across atrial tissue. And if you see both of them and you incorporate them into your color scheme, you're going to get two different areas of early and late and that's just going to be visually confusing so uh, sometimes there's a time and a place for mapping more locally uh, and that may in fact uh, uh, clarify the situation with regards to the activation map and making sense of it so it actually wasn't a coincidence that i created a small reentry circuit near the superior vena cava as that last example because that was in fact exactly the rhythm from the very first example I showed at the beginning of these slides going back to this slide that you remember well from the start the question that I had in mind after I created this talk and then went back to this index case I asked myself, well, what were the pitfalls in activation mapping that led to these erroneous maps and led to entrainment mapping really being the main tool that helped guide ablation? Well, there were several problems with this arrhythmia and the activation map that all together led to the problems that we encountered. First of all, this patient had had a previous cavotricuspid isthmus ablation with a line of block on the floor of the right atrium. And that is the reason that there was this appearance of an early meets late low, um, uh, barrier uh, between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid valve. And that's akin to the scenario I showed a while ago where we talked about having a barrier creating a misleading appearance of an early meets late uh, but in fact, it was really just a barrier and the late activation was simply passive. And if you entrained from that late location, it would be way out and far from the origin of the tachycardia. That was problem number one in this case. Problem number two was those of you might who were astute might have picked this up when I showed this particular window and map that there was a rather broad area of red on the interatrial septum which might have been a clue that we perhaps should have mapped the left atrium as well remember this scenario where i had showed an early spot in the right atrium but that spot shifted to the left atrium when we did more thorough mapping after a transeptal puncture well in this case in fact, I had shared initially that the tachycardia terminated when we ablated here, which it did, but the tachycardia returned, and it was only once we went to the left atrium and mapped it and ablated actually on both sides of the interatrial septum that we were able to get what turned out to be a short circuit in the top of the interatrial septum, which was thick muscle in this case. You know, it was only then that we got the rhythm to uh, terminate and not recur. So we didn't have enough mapping to fully clarify uh, the, um, the arrhythmia origin. And lastly, and most importantly, uh, this patient had a lot of scar and the tachycardia was relatively fast. And so we had a difficult time finding the right window um, notice here that in this window we had multiple areas of red, multiple areas of early meets late, and this really mirrors the model that I created where we saw multiple locations of early meets late, multiple areas of early activation, and simply this has to do with the 
sometimes almost impossible task of finding the appropriate window because the tachycardia is fast enough and the conduction velocity is slow enough that you have multiple wavefronts competing and clouding the picture when it comes to creating a color map. So for all of these reasons, activation mapping in that case uh, was confusing and misleading. This leads to the question, of course, what should we do as we're deciding on how to create a window of interest? There are a couple uh, simple ways that you can maximize the likelihood that you pick the right window. Um, and uh, here is one common technique that is described in this paper by DuPonti. And uh, they described a somewhat complicated formula uh, that basically defines how the window of interest uh, should be uh, created. And um, I can actually reduce this formula to uh, a very simple concept uh, visually. What they actually intended to do was this. They wanted the left caliper of the window of interest to be exactly in mid electrical diastole, halfway between the end of one P wave and the start of the next. So if you could figure out where a P wave starts and ends, that's the electrical systole, and you found the electrical diastole period from the end of one P wave to the start of the next, and then you found the exact middle of that diastolic electrical period, that will serve as your left caliper for your window of interest. And then you look at the tachycardia cycle length and you make the right caliper for your window of interest either at or slightly less than the tachycardia cycle length. As I said earlier, some people like to use 100%, uh, some people like to use 90 or 95% of the tachycardia cycle length. You don't want to go much shorter than that because you want to make sure you include um, the electrograms of interest in your window. But that is the DuPonti window. Uh, and the point of this is to make sure you try to catch the very beginning of the electrograms of interest by having the window start in diastole before electrical systole begins. So you don't clip off the initial electrograms of the beat of interest. There's your window. Another method uh, from the Mass General said, well, atrial, elect uh, atrial tachycardias may be analogous to ventricular tachycardias in PVCs. And in VT or PVCs, we often will use a window of interest that starts at least 40 milliseconds before the beginning of the QRS, because that's about as early as you get. And maybe that should be uh, the same or analogous in the atrium. So if you found the beginning of a P wave and you use a window of interest that starts at least 40 milliseconds, or they say at 40 milliseconds before the onset of the surface P wave, then that may give you a window that will catch the earliest electrograms for that beat and not clip them off and miss them. And so here's how this would look. Uh, if you say, okay, here's the onset of the P wave in this atrial flutter example, and you precede that by 40 milliseconds, that's where your window will start. And then you look at the tachycardia cycle length and you go 90 to 100% of the tachycardia cycle length and define the end of your window and there is your window of interest. Notice in both of these uh, methods, you are not using the 50% rule. You're not saying, I'm going to take a reference and split the difference, split the tachycardia cycle length in half and go minus that half amount and plus that half amount. In both cases, instead, you're using the surface P wave and you're defining the left caliper, not anything to do with where the reference is, but where the P wave onset is so that you can be sure to catch 
the beginning of the electrograms for that beat. And your reference electrogram may be early or late in that window, but certainly not in the middle of it. And it doesn't matter where it is because, again, the timing is relative as we reviewed at the beginning. It's not the absolute local activation time. It's the relative activation time that matters. The problem with these methods is it's often really hard to know where is the start of the P wave. For example, is it here in this example? The segments preceding what I initially thought might be the beginning of the P wave here are not flat. They're not isoelectric. It's not really electrical diastole. So this uh, P wave might start anywhere uh, in here. There might be electrograms that are happening. Even if it's not a lot of bulk of tissue that's being activated, it may be enough that I should have included that as part of the P wave. What about here? Is this the beginning of the P wave in this tachycardia example? What about these small little blips that appear beat after beat that are not artifact but are real? Uh, are those to be incorporated into the P wave and the P wave may start earlier somewhere over there? So in order to define a DuPonti window or an MGH window, you, you need to define the beginning of the P wave and that's not always easy for these reasons. But also the fact is that many times there can be one to one or two to one AV conduction and you can't find the beginning of the P wave because the P waves are buried in the T waves and or the QRS complexes. So here, for example, uh, is that bump the P wave, the T wave, is it a U wave? It'd be very difficult to define the beginning of the P wave and therefore define where your window of interest should be. So in summary, here are the points that I think one should take from this talk. First and foremost, when you're starting to create an activation map, you need to make sure that you have a sharp, stable reference that's appropriate for the rhythm that you're mapping. That would, of course, be a sharp R wave peak or S wave trough on the surface QRS if you're mapping the ventricles for a VT or a PVC. And for atrial arrhythmias, you want to use an intracardiac electrogram on a stable catheter, which is usually positioned in the coronary sinus, which tends to be a location that houses the catheter well and prevents it from migrating through the case. You need to be sure that all local activation time points are taken in the same rhythm that you're looking to map. If the arrhythmia terminates or switches to a different arrhythmia in the middle of the map and you continue to take points, you're of course going to end up with an activation map that blends the uh, two arrhythmias into one and it'll be a meaningless activation map. So it's always important to double check, especially if you notice that your color scheme seems to be changing. You need to confirm that you're in fact in the same rhythm that you were when you started. You should also be sure that with each point you've assigned the local activation time correctly and according uh, to your preference. This includes when you have double potentials or fractionated signals at a particular spot, you need to have a consistent way to annotate them from a timing standpoint. Usually people will take the first sharp deflection when there's a multi-component signal, but you have to decide what is your goal. For example, if somebody is mapping a Purkinje initiated PVC, you're going to want to be sure that in your activation map you include only the his Purkinje signals at each point and not the local myocardial signal if you want to properly map that his Purkinje PVC. You want to make sure you don't include artifactual signals or unwanted far field signals uh, in your activation uh, map uh, because as we discussed even a single point uh, will completely throw off the map if it's annotated at the wrong timing. If that should occur when you're well into the creation of the map, it's usually pretty obvious because there will be a sudden color shift 
and you'll say, wait a minute, something just happened, and you can scrutinize the points that you recently added. However, if you have a wrong signal that was incorporated into the map early and perpetuates through the map, then you may not know it. And when you have hundreds of points in your map, you may, uh, it may be a difficult task to go back and find what point is erroneous. That said, usually if it's only one or two points, it does not match the surrounding points and looks like an outlier and you can go back and review the electrograms from those points and erase them or change the local activation time assignment if that's appropriate. If you have an atrial arrhythmia with a wide P wave, meaning a very slow conduction time across the atrial tissue, and or a short cycle length, you should not create a window of interest that is symmetrical around your reference point for all the reasons we discussed. You're going to end up inadvertently clipping off electrograms from the beginning of the bead of interest and or clipping off desired electrograms at the end of the bead of interest. And you may incorporate the tail end of the previous beat or the leading end of the next beat into your map, which will completely cloud the picture and create a misleading color scheme for your three-dimensional activation map. Instead, you should have your left window of interest margin precede the surface P wave by at least 40 milliseconds and as early as the mid-diastolic point between P waves according to DuPonti, as we reviewed. It's so important when you're making an activation map to understand the basic principles of activation mapping so that you can troubleshoot. It's really only when you fully appreciate the limitations of activation mapping and how it can go wrong or mislead that you really can become masterful at using it as a tool. You can recognize when you're in a situation where it may be giving you wrong or misleading information, and you can course correct if you find that the activation map is not making sense and troubleshoot because you're aware of what the problems are that can uh, creep up uh, in the middle of or even at the beginning of a case when you're creating a map of a particular arrhythmia, most notably atrial arrhythmias where there is scar. Lastly, it's always important to get data from multiple locations using multiple techniques in order to confirm what you think you know. That means using entrainment or other complementary mapping techniques to confirm that yes, this spot that appears as red uh, is in fact early and or you have an early meets late situation, use entrainment to be sure that you are dealing with a macro reentry circuit and not simply a focal tachycardia with a passive late element because of a line of block, for example. So it's always important not to put all your eggs in one basket, and that's just a general good piece of advice for all of electrophysiology. I really want to thank you all for your attention I hope you found this activation mapping talk useful. Uh, as I stated at the beginning, a lot of this talk was inspired by conversations that I had with wonderful colleagues on Twitter. There's my Twitter handle as a reminder for those of you who want to join in in our conversation with other EPs and cardiologists. Uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, it's a very open community with wonderful dialogue where I learn from others. I hope people learn from me. Uh, it's been a really rewarding experience. Uh, so again, thank you. I hope this was useful. And I look forward to creating other talks in the near future that I will share.